nine of IAUM. Uh, I also obtained a postgraduate diploma in Islamic studies at yeah, IAUM. So I think uh, without further delay, uh, I would like to invite uh, Brother Muhammad Al-Fakir Basri to deliver his talk on Umar Sina. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wassalamu ala syafi'i anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanakallahi wa bihamdihi illa ma 'allamtana innaka innaka anta alimul hakim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, Ustaz Nazri for uh, as the chairperson for tonight and as mentioned by Ustaz Nazri this is our second episodes of our uh, scholars in campus great, great scholars in campus basically under IOHK we try to cover all the scholars that's been uh, embedded their names uh, onto the building at CFS IUM one by one insyaAllah kita cubalah cover semua so that it's not just the name, but we know the contribution. We know who the scholars are. Uh, so they will become inspiration to us. Lah. Okay, and last two weeks, we have a session with Dr. Irfan from UMP for al -Kawarizmi. Okay, I believe that uh, most of you uh, attended the session. Okay, kalau something yang memang available lah. And today, insyaAllah, I try to cover on the Mimar Sinan. Okay, one of... Uh, I think amongst all the scholars that we have in uh, UM, uh, other than Abu Wakar, okay, he's uh, quite different in terms of uh, the background of study or in terms of his scholarship. Yes, others, kalau kita nampak, the other scholars mostly, uh, they have the written punya uh, outcome of their of the scholarship. Contohnya, dia ada buku, dia ada kitab yang dikarang kan? Saya tahu Khawarizmi, kitab dia apa, for example, Ibn Sina, what's the kitab, everything lah. But not uh, Mimar Sinan. Yeah, because the works, basically, we can see the contribution of Mimar Sinan through the building that uh, he basically designed and constructed. So, dalam bentuk yang tangible lah. It's not just tangible di buku, tapi dalam bentuk something yang dah dikonstruk. Okay, because uh, architect dia tak terlalu buku, dia buat bangunan. Uh, tu different dia antara orang lain lah. Kalau orang lain, sekolah lain dia menulis kan. Uh, tapi architect kita tunjukkan our, profession, our proficiency and our skills through our design. Uh, that's the reason, uh, uh, something that's different lah. Okay, that's why uh, during our studies, during my, my studies before, uh, whenever we have a final examination, Okay, when we have an exam on history, for example, history of architecture, everything kan. So, 90% of our uh, answer script is all in drawings. Uh, this sikit-sikit je tu tulis. Uh, kita, we, we switch through drawings. So, everything semua drawing, kalau kita tengok contohnya student AED punya, penuh kan drawing, banyak drawing sketches, macam cantik kan. Macam, oh, dia dah satu macam sketchbook pula. Uh, pada yang tu ada answer script for exam. Uh, memang kita... Uh, explain everything through drawings. Okay, that's the difference. Lah. So, today, uh, it will be a bit different in terms of the approach because uh, before this, Dr. Irfan boleh cakap pasal buku ni, pasal buku ni, all the, in terms of, uh, tapi I try to simplify a bit because I believe that if I go to technical, then it will be difficult for others to understand. Because I believe uh, tak ada student ID kan dekat sini. Okay, tak ada. Sudah so, jadi tak ada. Okay, <laughs> ada sudah medi, ada sudah HS I believe. Okay, so kita try make it uh, easier for for all to understand. Okay, okay, the topic is on the Mimar Sinai. I, I was given uh, this topic, Mimar Sinai. Okay, the greatest designer in the history of some architecture. Okay, I have my head of department, Brother Abdul Rahman. Okay, head of AED. <laughs> so the only two person yang ada background in architecture lah. Okay. <laughs> 
Ali ke ada orang yang boleh betulkan saya lah kalau for example saya tersalah ke everything lah. Okay. Say so, Bimar Sinan is the greatest designer in the history of Sami architecture. Why who is Bimar Sinan? Bimar Sinan is basically the uh, the chief architect during the uh, the the golden era of Ottoman Empire. Okay, or Osmanli Empire lah. Uh, in, uh, Ottoman civilization. Zaman Usmaniyah zaman dulu tu. Uh, he is basically the chief architect during the the peak uh, 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 the peak period of the civilization. So banyak-banyak yang sekarang ni dekat uh, Turki tu the one yang uh, masjid-masjid yang besar-besar Romania uh, complex Sal Salamia punya masjid everything, masjid biru everything tu kebanyakan a bit by him. Ha, ni yang Mimar Sinan lah. Itu legacy dia lah. Kita boleh nampak sampai sekarang legacy tu masih ada di situ lah. Okay. So that's why kita ada nama Mimar Sinan. Okay. And uh, right now here in CFS, Mimar Sinan basically covers Department of Architecture, Department of Languages and Management and we have Department of Legal Studies. Ha, tiga department lah dekat situ. Okay. Macam menarik kan? Nama Mimar Sinan tapi kita ada banyak komponen kat bawah Mimar Sinan tu sendiri. Okay. 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 Next, we have some overview of the timeline of Ottoman Empire. Okay. This is the overview of uh, sama Ottoman lah. Uh, since the first establishment in uh, 1064. Okay. When they, they conquer uh, the, the area up until the decline of the empire in 1909. Okay, we have some of the uh, prominent uh, sultan, uh, the, the sultan of Ottoman Empire. And uh, during this time, uh, Mimar Sinan basically would be in this, nombor apa ni? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, at the 9th uh, phase. Uh, 1481 until 1466, uh, that's it, the golden age of Ottoman Empire. Okay. Uh, during this time, uh, dekat sini lah, uh, Golden Age of Ottoman Empire, we have the uh, Sulaiman, Sulaiman the Magnificent, uh, yang sekarang ada movie, ada cerita dekat dalam TV tu kan. Uh, this is during this time, uh, the, uh, the great, uh, Sula the Sulaiman the Great, uh, one of the, uh, they, they said that this is the, the best sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, and after the uh, the death of, okay, the, the demise of Sulaiman, uh, Sulaiman Eventually, the empire start to decline. Okay. So, this is some overview. Okay, next, we have the scope of the Ottoman Empire. Okay. Uh, this is the map of the empire. Basically, we have the... Here is the Turkey right now. Lah. We have Bursa, we have Gallipoli, we have Istanbul over here. And this is the Asian side of the empire. And another one is the the European side of the empire. Dekat sini. Nampak sekejap ya. Okay, this one is the uh, Asian side of the empire. Belah Asia. And then another one is belah uh, Eropa. Okay, because Turkey currently is divided into two. Where one side is Asia, another side is Europe kan. So, we have the, the uh, Bosphorus Minas Strait dekat tengah-tengah ni lah. Okay, we have Dead Sea. So, during that time, in Ottoman Empire, we have up until Algiers. Uh, dekat Algeria, dekat belah sana, hala ke uh, Morocco. Uh, this is the Morocco. And then we have the Tunis, and Tunisia, everything. Tripoli in Libya. We have Cairo in Egypt. Up until Medina, until the end of uh, almost to Yaman, over here. And then we have the Bahrain, everything. Dekat belah sini dengan Oman. Basra in, Basra dekat mana? In Iraq. Okay, betul. Okay, and then we have uh, the Tigris and Euphrates over here. Surai Furat, semua dekat, dekat situ. Up until the Vienna, Venice, uh, almost dekat kawasan sana lah. Belgrade, uh, so semua kawasan ni dah dikongkak oleh during that time by Ottoman Empire. Okay, uh, Bosnia, everything semua tu under uh, Ottoman Empire lah during the, the peak period of uh, the empire. Okay, so this is basically the overview of the empire of Osmania. Okay. So now we go to who is Mimar Sinan okay, as a person. Okay, this is uh, some artist impression of Mimar Sinan. We are lucky because during, uh, previously we have during Kawarazmi, we only have some impression 
of the the looks of Mimar C9 but because Mimar C9 is quite late 1500 something so the records or the drawing is much better compared to the earlier periods so we have a quite a good representation of the image of Mimar C9 and then even the sculpture just now is quite uh, detailed to show the uh, figures of Mimar C9 okay this is Mimar C9 Okay, uh, do you know that? Okay, nampak tak? Kalau orang Turki tu dulu kan, dia pakai sebab besar macam tu kan, macam tulip kan? Okay, even the word tulip is basically derived from the word turban itself dalam bahasa Turki. Ah, uh, itu asalnya uh, turban macam untuk tulip tu ada dengan bunga tulip. Ah, uh, dia almost antika lah. So, because dalam bahasa Turki dia turban tu almost antika to tulip. And eventually, nama bunga tu nama bunga tulip. Okay. Okay, uh, <coughs> Mimar Kosa Sinan, okay, Mimar is actually architect. Uh, Mimar, uh, Sinan tu nama dia. Okay, architect Mimar Sinan lah. Okay, Mimar Kosa Sinan or the great architect Sinan was born in Anatolia. Okay, the, before this is Turkey. In 1889 and he died in Istanbul in 1588. He basically served three sultan of Ottoman. Okay, termasuk Sulaimanian, uh, Sulaiman the, the Greats lah. Okay, generally considered as the greatest of all Ottoman architects. Uh, because it's, it spent almost 50 years, okay, uh, since he was appointed as chief royal architect. Means that as a chief royal architect, it's 50 years, and before that, uh, during uh, uh, his life as a as a one of the in the military, basically he served in a, in a quite 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 number of years, okay, and uh, okay, he was basically the the royal architect for Sultan Sulaiman in uh, 1539. Okay, his great mosque are the archetypal uh, image of the Turkish Ottoman architecture. Okay, after this, I am going to explain what is the image of a uh, Turkish, Turkish mosque architecture. Okay. Okay, during his long career, Sinan built hundreds of buildings. Uh, some would say that almost 400 over building. It's not just about mosque, but also covers any, any type of other type of building, termasuk madrasa, uh, schools. Okay, we have uh, caravanserais, we have lots of other things, aqueducts, everything. Okay, madrasa, caravanserai, granaries, fountains, aqueduct, and hospital. Okay, all everything is being built during the uh, the fifty years as a royal architect, and his mosque has been the most influential. And I would say that up until now, uh, people start still using the. Uh, the form of the mosque that being proposed by Mimar Sinan. Okay. Uh, the proof is that even kat Malaysia pun kita buat masjid wilayah kan. Masjid wilayah persekutuan kan. Uh, this is using the uh, the language of is uh, Turkish punya uh, Ottoman punya uh, mosque design. Okay. Okay. Sinan basically exerted his incentive experimentation with centralized dome spaces often compared with the parallel development in Renaissance Italy. Okay. Because during the time of Sinan uh, the the time the timeline is basically parallel between Sinan as well as the Renaissance in Italy. So that's why they compare Mimar Sinan to Michelangelo in the West. Uh, okay, like macam Mimar Sinan is Michelangelo in the East. Uh, they're up to that level. We, we know the level of Michelangelo, kan? Because after the study, got the, the level of artistry, everything. Okay, this is comparable between uh, Mimar Sinan as well as uh, Michelangelo. Okay, up to that point, people compare. Okay, and even to the, to some extent, people say that because uh, they, they, they are uh, living in the same timeline, okay, some of the influence is there. We can see that the influence between the one that, that, that we have in Turkey during that time and the one in, in Italy is almost identical, the elements, elements of architecture. Okay, if you study in terms of architecture, we can see the elements is almost identical. Okay, apa yang ada dekat sana dengan yang ada dekat, dekat sini. So, because they are the timeline. You can see that there will be some traits happening between the two world, the west and the east. So, then the mix of culture of uh, sharing of knowledge tu dah berlaku dekat situ lah. Okay. And then the thing to note is that, yang penting kita tahulah, Mimar Sinan ni dia uh, jauh ke depan lagi compared to the other scholars. Ibn Sina, Al-Kawarizmi, everything, Ibn Rush, semua tu yang semua ke belakang. Yang tu zaman-zaman Abbasiyah kemajakannya. Okay, but Imar Sinan dia jauh ke depan sikit, uh, that is Ottoman. Ottoman ni dalam Islamic, dalam Islamic civilization is quite later lah, later stage of Islamic civilization. So, dia tak ada dah uh, tentang yang nak explore something yang baru, guna Greek, Sri knowledge, everything. Dia tak sampai up to that point lah. Okay, dia, sekarang ni dia just existing dengan apa the, the existing knowledge and now how they 
uh, basically innovate based on that. Okay. Okay, next we have the background. Okay, he was born in 1490 or 885 Hijrah. 895 Hijrah dah, which is quite dah hampir 1000 tahun dah selepas Hijrah lah. So macam it's quite recent lah compared to the others. For example, kalau macam yang lain-lain tu, uh, tahun uh, 600 lebih, 500 lebih, 400 lebih Hijrah. Yang tu kena buat perusahaan hurun dia pun dah berbeza lah compared to the other scholars of Islam. Okay, and then uh, there's some contention on the uh, uh, his life as a as a child do, uh, during that time, ada yang cakap dia ni adalah orang yang bukan Islam. Okay, tapi because di co falsely converted into Islam by 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 the empire lah, daripada uh, Uthmaniyah zaman tu. But some says that actually the fathers basically converted to Islam, reverted to Islam and then eventually all the families member uh, follow suit. Ada yang macam tu lah. So, but, but it's okay. So, we know that it is uh, born in Anatolia basically and after that, uh, during his uh, teenage year, he joined a uh, janissary, uh, being constricted to janissary. Janissary is one form of a uh, uh, military lah, macam army lah dalam Ottoman Empire. Selalunya orang-orang yang bukan uh, daripada luar, dia akan masuk dalam kat situ macam himat negara lah pada waktu tu. Okay, himat compulsory punya himat negara lah, join janissary. Okay, during this time, uh, Mimar Sinan basically established himself lah. Okay. And he basically joined the army. Okay, they go up until to Belgrade. Belgrade, tahu kan dekat atas-atas sekali dekat area Bosnia, uh, Serbia, everything. The Belgrade to Vienna, Vienna in Italy okay. and to, even to Baghdad. Uh, Baghdad jauh ke sana belah sana kan? Because this is a military expedition. During that time, uh, Ottoman Empire is, expans uh, is expanding. Okay, memang tengah expand. So, they join, he basically joined all these things. And during this time, Mimar Sinan, uh, shows his uh, proficiency in uh, engineering as well as architecture whereby in during the Persian War, uh, one of uh, uh, there's there, there, a war uh, basically happened uh, surrounding the lake, ada satu nama, nama satu tasik tu and then during that time, Mimar Sinan come up with a, uh, a genius idea whereby he basically constructed ferries to ferry all the army from one side to another side. Uh, dia buat satu ferry macam Besar ferry, tahu kan besar kan untuk angkut orang kan Dia buat ferry, dia to cross the lake To the other side uh, Bayangkan during military punya expedition kan is, it, it, Everything is quite limited Into all resources but he can think of that Okay And then even in, during in One of a war happening in Romania Okay He basically built a bridge Okay, to cover uh, To cross uh, the Danube River Danube River is one of the Main rivers in Europe so he basically can divide during the short period of time, he basically constructed a bridge just to cross, <coughs> for the military to cross the, the river. Okay, that's his. During this time that uh, the the top military or the army of the empire basically recognized his uh, contribution and his flares in design, in designing lah. So later on he was basically absorbed into this military or architecture punya uh, units lah in, in the military and eventually it become the Chief Court Architects, okay, by uh, Sulaiman, during the time of Sulaiman the Great. And eventually he died in uh, 1588, tahun 1996 Hijrah. Uh, dekat 1000 tahun sebelum Hijrah dah. Which is dah quite jauh jugalah period dia dengan zaman, zaman Nabi lah. Okay. Okay, uh, that's basically some overview or background story of uh, Mimar Sinai. Okay, so far any question? Ada soalan ke nak tanya? Ada lagi? Okay. So now we go to the uh, technical things a bit on the legacy of Mimar Sinai. That's the most important thing I think that we need to know apa yang Mimar Sinai contributed to uh, to our civilization or uh, to our life right now lah. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, before this, because he is more involved in architecture, so some of you might not be able to appreciate what I'm trying to to share to you, but I try as 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 much as possible to simplify everything. Okay, insyaAllah lah kita cuba belajar architecture sikit malam ni ya. Okay. <laughs> okay, number one, the legacy of Imar Sinan is on the the widening and unification of the main space. Okay, basically, uh, Mimar Sinan basically redesigned the uh, 
the spaces in a mosque dalam dalam masjid tu kan dia redesign balik the structure and the form of the mosque itself okay before this almost all the uh, all the masjid or okay, all the mosque been built after the time of prophet following the uh, following the uh, the form of the prophet mosque dekat madinah tu uh, bentuk rumah nabi tu uh, that is the legacy of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam But the person, uh, you can see that during the Umayyah or even during the Abbasiyah, they are using the same pattern for the design of the mosque. Okay, but during this time, Bimah Sinan basically proposed a new type or new form of a mosque. Okay, taking some ideas from the Roman or by the Byzantine, kan? During that time after uh, the conquest of the, or the opening of Constantinople, okay, Constantinople was governed by the Byzantine Empire. Uh, what to do with Byzantine is Roman kan. So kita, we can see that the elements of Roman being integrated into Islamic architecture. Okay, that using that knowledge that from the Roman that he have and then all the experience he covers all the, during the military, he come up with the, their own style of architecture. Uh, kita panggil Ottoman punya mosque, punya design. Ada uh, berbeza sikit lah. Okay, so the widening and unification of the main space, the first satanic mosque in Of Sinan is the Shazet, uh, fulfill the aim by introducing four semi-dome on each side of the dome. Okay, now kita nampak masjid dah start ada dome. Okay, sebelum ni kita dah ada dome dah. The first dome in Islamic architecture dekat mana? Siapa boleh jawab? Because dome is not originally from Islamic architecture. Uh, Islamic architecture or basically borrow dome tu daripada the Roman. So, What is the first building yang using dome in Islamic architecture? Hmm. Ayah Sofia is not Islamic built by the Roman. Uh, uh, much earlier than that. Hmm. Yes, Dome of the Rock is the first dome in Islamic architecture basically. Even Dome of, uh, dome of the Rock, okay memang ya, cikgu sejarah kan? <laughs> Uh, because Dome of the Rock is the first dome in Islamic architecture taking inspiration from the the dome of the church during that time. Dekat Jerusalem pada waktu tu lah. Uh, the church of Hadi Hadi Sepuka. Uh, dekat situ lah. Uh, waktu tu zaman tu, the Khalifah zaman tu nampak macam eh cantik lah benda tu. Okay, then dia minta uh, artisan during that time, architect during that time to build something as similar to that. Uh, that's the first dome in Islamic architecture. So later on, we can see that the dome is there in the Umayyad Mosque, uh, the Great Mosque of Damascus pun ada juga dome kat situ, pun shape almost similar to the one that we have in Dome of the Rock. Later on, sampai lah zaman Mimah Sinai ni, uh, they're going to take inspiration from Hagia Sophia or Hagia Sophia tu. Okay, and then they dapatkan the, the knowledge of everything and then they construct or build something new from out of that. Uh, so sebelum ni, dome dia nampak macam kubah dia macam minggi sikit, macam dome kat masjid kita tu. But during this Ottoman, dome dia lebih landai. Dia macam luas, lagi luas dan lebih landai lah. Uh, that's uh, based on the Hagia Sophia punya model. Okay, Hagia Sophia is uh, basically the inspiration lah. It's just that Mimar Sinan basically uh, redesign or remodel the construction of the dome uh, to make it more uh, practical and more simpler. Uh, they improve banyak benda lah daripada situ. Uh, that's basically the essence of Islamic civilization actually. In Islamic civilization basically, in Islam we don't really uh, object everything. Kita tak reject semua benda. Okay, whenever uh, it is good and then it is beneficial for us, we can just accept that. Well, tak kisah daripada region mana atau daripada something yang uh, daripada source yang, yang lain-lain lah. Uh, that you can see that from the story of the four words and everything. Even zaman Nabi pun, Nabi pun dapatkan idea-idea daripada orang daripada luar. Okay, daripada sama Farisi for example kan. Uh, semua macam itulah. But whenever we reject something, we have to propose the solution. Uh, we have to propose the alternative. Uh, kita don't simply just reject macam tu je. We can, we have to offer the alternative lah. That's why Islam ni nampak lebih sangat, sangat flexible. Okay, uh, that's one of the way kenapa orang zaman-zaman dulu mudah tertarik dengan Islam tu sendiri. Uh, kita tak reject sahaja tapi kita propose alternative. Okay. So here, we can see that uh, the development from the first one up until the D, D is the most, uh, the, the complex model, uh, the complete model of Mimar Sinan lah. They try to explore with the dome combination of dome and then to make the uh, the interior parts of the building much uh, spacious. Uh, lebih besar daripada yang sebelum ni lah. Dekat sini. Uh, dia boleh sampai dia simplified dan lagi besar dan lebih simple the, the uh, apa ni? 
dia punya uh, spaces kat dalam tu. Okay. Kalau kat sini kita nampak dia lebih complicated kan. So imagine at, at, at every intersection there will be column kat dalam. So akan banyak-banyak column. So here is a, a minimum a minimum number of column but we have a very large space. Uh, that is the aspiration or the segmentation by memory sinai. Okay. Kita ada satu ruang yang besar tapi at the same time tak banyak column pun yang kat, kat dalam. Column tu tiang. Uh, uh, column tu tiang. Okay. So ruang yang besar tapi dengan minimum number of column. So that ruang tu uh, kalau untuk mosque design, ruang tu lah the best kan untuk, untuk semayang kan. So that dia punya soft tu tak, ter, tak terputus. Okay, it's not break. Okay, that's why uh, the exploration done by memory sinan lah. Okay, before this, sebelum uh, memory sinan come up with this type of models which is taken from the inspiration from Ayo Sophia. Okay, we have this type of model. Okay, this is the hypostyle mosque. Okay, hypostyle mosque is mosque yang based on Nabi Muhammad SAW punya rumah. Okay, the prophet mosque. Okay, this is the plan of the prophet mosque. During that time, Prophet Moss is basically the house of the Prophet. Okay. Okay, we have at this, uh, uh, at this, okay, there are two, uh, there are two plan here. Ada dua plan kat sini. Satu sebelum berlakunya pertukaran kiblat, satu lagi selepas pertukaran kiblat. Okay, mana satu selepas dan sebelum? Ah. Mana satu selepas dan sebelum pertukaran kiblat? Yang kecil, yang mana satu? Yang ni ke yang ni? <laughs> yang A ke yang B? Yang B. Yang B tu apa? Yang selepas. Okay, yang A ni? Sebelum. Okay, reason? Nampak cross? Mana cross? Cross ni uh, arah, arah tu arah utara. Uh, that's normal. Kosong. Kosong. Okey, kosong. Tak kosong actually. Ni ada tempat solat dia. Ada tempat sufah dia. Ada rumah hujurat. Ada rumah isteri Nabi kat sini. Okey. Okey, reason dia mudah je actually. Bukan kita tahu arah arah utara dia kat, kat atas kan. The, the first time kita solat adalah kita menghadap Batu Makhdis. Okey, ke Palestin lah. So, Batu Makhdis kalau dekat daripada Saudi Arabia tu ke arah utara. Which is kat atas. So that's why dia menghadap kat atas. Asalnya. Sebab tu kiblat asal menghadap ke sana. Ha, faham? Ke arah utara. Yang kat satu lagi ni. kiblat dia menghadap ke selatan. Ke Mekah. Mekah ke, ke selatan daripada Madinah. So that's why dia kat sini. So kita tahulah yang ni sebelum dan ni selepas. Okay. Uh, this is a component of uh, uh, the house of Prophet SAW sebelum so, ni. Uh, ataupun kita panggil masjid Nabi lah yang original. Okay, the upper part here is basically the praying area. Uh, atau kat atas ni atau kat bawah ni lah. This is the praying area. We have uh, three entrance to that. We have Babu Jibril, Babu Atika. And then we have sufa. Sufa uh, satu kat atas, satu kat bawah lah. Sebelum dan selepas. Sufa is basically the uh, a platform. Sufa itself is, in by definition, is a platform. Uh, the place whereby all the muhajirin yang daripada Mekah ke Madinah tu yang tak ada keluarga, yang tak ada pekerjaan semua kan macam tempat dia transit dekat sini lah, dia akan duduk kat situ. Uh, the people here we call as Ahli Sufah. Okay. Dayas. 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 Uh, bukan. Uh, bukan. Dia macam tempat tem tempat Uh, dia macam se-platform. Even sekarang ni in Masjid Nabawi tu, platform tu masih ada. Uh, tapi tak ada orang duduk lah sekarang kan. Okay, during that time, so mana-mana orang yang tak bekerja ke, yang tak ada masalah, tak ada family ke, tak berkeluarga lagi kat sana, dia akan stay kat situ macam rumah kebajikan kat situ lah. Uh, so, orang yang tak bekerja kan. So, kerja dia, kalau dia tak bekerja, dia akan spend masa dengan Nabi. Uh, dia akan dengan Nabi. That's why Ahli Sufah ni kebajikannya yang nerik hadis Nabi paling banyak. Uh, one of the Ali Sufah yang terkenal tu adalah Abu Hurairah. Uh, Abu Hurairah lah antara seorang Ali Sufah yang terkenal. That's why dia antara orang yang paling banyak narik hadis Nabi. But dia spend masa dengan Nabi. Okay. Kisah Ali Sufah ni, every time for example, kadang-kadang dia berlapar sebab dia tak bekerja semua kan. Dia tak ada, tak ada kekuatan everything. Kadang-kadang siapa nak datang ke, kadang dia sangkut lebuh rumah, standang kat situ untuk uh, Ali Sufah ni makan. Okey contoh yang kalau dalam hadis kita tahu hadis yang Nabi kongsi susu kan satu satu cawan susu tu tapi semua orang boleh kenyang kan 
Ha, itu kisah Nabi dengan Ali Sufah lah tu. Ha, berkonsekuensi semua orang kan. Ha, semua yang kelaparan. Okay, in one, in one hadis by Abu Hurairah, he mentioned that orang tanya dia, kenapa macam mana dia boleh narik banyak hadis dari Nabi kan? Compact to sahabat-sahabat yang lain. Sedangkan Umar ke Abu Bakar ke tak narik as much hadis macam dia. Sedangkan dia ada sahabat yang sangat rapat dengan Nabi. Okay, so uh, Abu Hurairah mentioned that Uh, whenever orang lain dah sebut dengan hal-hal dunia, berniaga, cari duit apa semua kan Dia hanya ada kat situ je lah, tak boleh buat apa-apa Orang lain dia boleh makan-makan pun, dia hanya berlapar dah kat situ Dan apa yang dia boleh buat dia, jumpa Nabi lah Jumpa Nabi and then try as much as possible Yang tu je dia apa yang dia boleh buat waktu, pada waktu tu lah That's why dia cakap dia paling banyak nerik Nabi Orang lain sebut dengan dunia tapi dia uh, Sebut dengan Nabi lah, uh, spend masa dengan Nabi So the point is that ada, I think ada ayat Al-Quran mention pasal Ali Sufah ni Ha, tentang uh, mulianya kerjaan untuk ada dengan Nabi itu sendiri lah Okay, untuk menunjukkan kemulaan Ahli Sufah ni sendiri So this is, okay, sini ada pairing area Kita ada Ahli Sufah kat belakang Ada kita have the, the hujrat Ataupun rumah sisi Nabi kat tepi ni Lalunya lepas asal Nabi akan pergi sebab bilik ni Untuk tanya khabar sisi dia so kat sini lah ha, Dia lah ha, So Nabi, whenever bila nak, nak waktu semayang Orang azan je dekat datang lah Terus daripada rumah terus pergi ke tempat solat Haa So all this thing, dekat sini, kat koyak yang besar ni is basically the the center of the uh, the, uh, the summit, the first summit session during the time, during the time of the prophet. Uh, semua pun berlaku kat dalam pasal sini lah. Uh, ni kita panggil rumah Nabi or the, the prophet mosque. And this is the replica of the mosque. Uh, simple je zaman dulu. Okay. Okay, next. Okay, from this one, uh, this during the time of the prophet ni, kita nampak the uh, the next evolution is It becomes like this. Almost identical kan? <coughs> Macam rumah Nabi tadi, plan dia. Kita ada praying area, ada kita ada tempat kat belakang, ada keliling macam tu. We have a lot, a very big courtyard in the middle. Okay, kat tengah ni lah. Here, this is the great mosque of Khairawan. Ada kat Khairawan. Okay. Uh, almost identical to the, the the Prophet Mosque. And then this one is the replica of the great mosque of Samara in Iraq. Okay, during the time of Abbasid Indian Caliphate. Uh, zaman Abbasiyah. So pun menggunakan yang sama. That's why yang ni kita panggil sebagai hypostyle punya mosque. Mosque design. Uh, bentuk dia, plan dia dan bentuk hypostyle. Uh, kita ada rows of column and then as a praying area. Uh, that's it hypostyle. But during the time of Mimar Sinan, dia come out dengan this new version. Uh, dia bukan dalam skor yang besar tapi dia satu structure yang besar tu sini tempat orang solat. Uh, dia bukan dalam bentuk colonnades. Sudah lah. Uh, okay. So nampak beza sikit lah. Faham? Dia tak kisah guna term yang uh, a bit technical untuk difahami lah. So that is uh, one of the most major contribution by Mimar Sinai. Uh, he redesigned the most design lah. Like the most architecture. Okay. So that's the first one lah. Okay. The second one, we have the Mimar Sinai is that he basically improved the luminosity of the uh, of the interior uh, dalam most tu sendiri. Okay. This is the, the the two pictures basically the uh, the comparison between uh, this is a, a Sulaiman uh, the Great Mosque of Sulaiman okay so Sulaimania uh, complex okay or mosque and another one is is Hagia Sophia Hagia Sophia kita nampak mana satu lebih terang kan antara dua ni okay ada perbezaan antara dua ni kita nampak mana satu lebih terang uh, that is one of the way we must see basically improve the design layouts of the interior of the mosque itself. Okay, before this, because uh, this Sulaiman punya mosque ni is taken inspiration from Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia waktu tu sangat grand, sangat besar kan. So, you want to imitate something that's as bigger as grand as Hagia Sophia. So, they improve the layout of Hagia Sophia. Okay, that's why you boleh dapat satu uh, interior space yang sangat nampak open, light, Light in terms of light, light, uh, light illumination di sendiri. At the same time, kita dapat light in terms of the structure itself. Dia tak serabut kat dalam tu. Uh, dia tak pack sangat kat dalam kan. Compared to Ayah Sofia kat bawah ni, ada kolom lah kat sini, ada, ada banyak benda lah. Ada macam dia macam, there's a lot of obstruction inside the praying area itself. Okay, okay. Because Ayah Sofia itself is not built for as a mosque. Dia adalah satu cathedral kan zaman tu. Uh, dia adalah gereja asalnya. Okay. So, kini kita boleh nampak lah. Okay, this is Sulaiman punya mosque. 
very simplified kan version kat dalam ni Okay, together this is Hagia Sophia punya interior kat dalam Nampak tak perbezaan dia tu One is very sleek, very modern, very simple version compared to this one Uh, this is the second contribution of Mimar Sinan. He simplified the construction of the dome. The reason why dalam Hagia Sophia ni ada macam kang kabut kat dalam tu ada there's a lot of column, there's a lot there's lots of thing happening because the way they construct the dome. Nak construct satu dome yang besar tu untuk bagi the stable betul uh, that's why they, uh, the, the architect of Hagia Sophia come up with this type of architecture lah. But Mimar Sinan managed to Simplify the construction of the dome itself Menyebabkan dia nampak lebih uh, Simplified Okay, this uh, this mosque ni Untuk dapatkan benda ni uh, This simplified version of the construction of the dome ni That's why dia Kena come out all this Experimentation Experiment 1, 1, 1 Sampai dia dapat the simplified version macam ni uh, uh, This true uh, And then to do this It takes years dia bukan terus buat hari ni, ok ni kita construct terus boleh buat kan Ni ada satu mosque buat first, first mosque kita buat dekat Edin Next, satu lagi mosque dekat Fatih Ni mosque by Yazid in Shazid Shazid ni adalah the replica, the best mosque lah yang Miman, uh, Mimar Sinan berjaya hasilkan uh, Dan selepas tu semua masjid menggunakan dia punya template macam ni uh, This is after experimentation, bayangkan this is Take off, for example 10 years, it's another 10 years, it's another 10 years, it's another 10 years 40 tahun contoh, contoh 40 tahun untuk dia dapatkan something yang As simple as uh, practical macam yang Sulaiman punya mosque macam ni Okay, uh, that's is the on, uh, the ongoing effort of Imar Sinan during that time Okay, nampak tak dia punya engineering progress and the design progress yang dia ada By Imar Sinan itself, okay Okay, faham? Boleh? Boleh ikut? Okay. <laughs> okay, tapi Yes. Okay. So far from my from my reading, I haven't uh, come across uh, to the, the specific term because uh, looking at the the shape of the dome or the form of the dome compared Uh, if you compare between Hagia Sophia together with Sulaiman or other type of dome yang dihasilkan, it's almost identical je. Tak ada masalah. So, uh, tulip yang dia punya tu kan? Uh, uh, turban dia. Tapi kalau untuk dome, saya tak rasa nak macam tulip sangat sebab dia tak cukup tinggi lah for, for tulip. Hmm? Hmm, adalah sikit dia punya lentik dia tu sikit lah uh, kat situ. Ah uh, Yes. Uh. Hmm, okay. okay, that's why kalau siapa yang perasan uh, Saya rasa tak ada orang perasan pun uh, <laughs> Tak ada orang perasan, saya perasan actually Tapi saya nak tegur, tapi saya macam Tak apalah tak ada orang perasan saya rasa Memang tak ada orang perasan <laughs> Kalau kita tengok poster yang Poster this event kan, program ni kan Yang dia ada gambar mersinan Ada satu mosque kat tepi dia kan Kita tengok, okay Yang tu actually Hayah Sofia It's not designed by Mimar Sinan uh, Actually, it's salah, salah building actually uh, Sepatutnya letak Sulaiman yang punya mosque ke Sal uh, Salim punya mosque ke kat situ kan <laughs> Tapi bila tengok tu macam, oh, tak apa orang lain tak perasan kot <laughs> Sebab benda tu dah post saya email kan saya malas saya tegur actually okay, Actually, tersalah actually referen kat situ Okay Yes. Oh yes. Ah, uh, relevan lah juga. Ah, relevan lah juga. Boleh lah. <laughs> Because uh, people see Sofia dia tak ada lah minaret, minaret masjid semua kan. It's being added after that, after the conquest of Constantinople tu sendiri lah. Okay. So we notice that uh, number of minaret is uh, lot uh, Oh yes. Okay, kalau if you're referring to the the numbers of minaret in in most design in some architecture kan, there, there are few uh, reason why we constructed minaret. Number one, of course, to azan, to uh, as a for play for muazin. Okay, second one is actually during that time, it can be, it become landmark. Dia perlu jauh, kita boleh nampak. 
can uh, sometimes during uh, during the, the night okay they will lit up the minaret kita akan tambah api kat situ lah jadi kapal boleh nampak as a landmark kat situ lah macam rumah api jugalah one of the function itself and then another one is actually uh, yang ni kita boleh nampak dekat masjid haram masjid uh, okay, masjid nabi kan okay, masjid lain yang besar-besar dekat dalam dunia Islam ni actually it's a symbol of status symbol of status maksudnya okay, bila sultan ni naik uh, dia nak buat satu minaret untuk represent dia punya minaret Ah, uh, that's why kalau masjid dia haram kita boleh nampak kan ada banyak design minaret berbeza-beza uh, bukan it representing the uh, the ruler during that time Ah, uh, this one of the reason lah uh, minaret tu simbol status dia ok berapa banyak ok kadang even dia tak construct masjid pun tapi dia tambah minaret kat situ tu menunjukkan ada dia punya uh, contribution lah to that particular design <laughs> tak, saya tak rasa tak <laughs> yes, Contoh, for example, uh, Sulaimaniyah uh, Sulaiman punya masjid ni kan Dia ada dua je minarik yang besar uh, Yang lain tak ada, tapi uh, masjid yang lebih kecil kadang ada lagi banyak minarik Compared to this one lah Okay Okay, next we have the Okay, earthquake engineering and drainage system Okay, because Turkey, uh, Turkey basically, uh, Turkey right now, okay is basically prone to earthquake kan. Okay, uh, last year we have a very huge earthquake happening in Turkey but none of this building basically affected. Uh, that's the genius of the past lah. Apa yang Bimar Sinan, okay, especially uh, lakukan during that time. Okay, because actually uh, even the construction of the mosque during that time is already almost identical to the one that we are using right now in terms of engineering part. Every layers of the uh, the bricks or uh, the blocks, uh, the stone block actually is layered by uh, a lead, lead punya sheeting. Okay, atau perlambun satu logam lah kat tengah in between. So that dia boleh absorb the uh, the pressure or the, the pressure of the earthquake itself. So dia tak mudah crack, tak mudah sumbang lah. Uh, during even that, that time, uh, Mimar Sinan si dah device the, that kind of uh, system. Okay, dah ada railing system, dah ada lots of system, basically to uh, to withstand the earthquake. Okay, for example here one of it, uh, they leave the foundation of a structure for a couple of years because he built the rest on the top. Uh, that's in, even today's, we do that. Perasaan tak kalau mak ayah nak buat rumah kan, dia tambun tanah tu lama setahun dua tambun tanah baru buat rumah kat atas tu. Uh, that's basically to, to allow the foundation to settle or the, the soil ataupun the earth to settle. The settle maksudnya dia dah padat lah. Ada uh, baru kita boleh construct something kat atas tu. Uh, boleh jadi lebih kuat. Uh, that's the reason. Even Mimar Sina has been using that method with back then. So, zaman dulu lagi pun dah digunakan lah. That's why the structure is quite uh, stable. Or even the the shape of the foundation is quite, uh, is different compared to the one that we have. Is it staggered? So, whenever there's it drop one layer, everything will drop one layer. So, dia akan drop sama, sama. Okay, dia tak, dia tak, satu drop, satu tak. So, dia takkan crack. Uh, that's uh, the one of uh, engineering punya marvel that we have during the time. Okay. Okay, that's is on the uh, earthquake engineering and drainage system. Okay, having uh, all the basically uh, under 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 the the mosque itself, uh, usually there will be uh, like a a complicated drainage system. Okay, to untuk pengaliran air semula jadi everything kat dalam tu lah. Okay, next we have the environmental design. Okay, uh, the oil lamp and candle because during that time kita dah we, we have no electricity. Okay, we have lots of candles. Okay, it's, it was mentioned that in Sulaimaniyah Sulaman punya masjid saja ada 4,000 candles being lit every day just to lit the interior during the night. 4,000 candles banyak kan? So, bayangkan berapa banyak jelaga yang kita ada. Uh, candles kan akan pembakaran tak sempurna kan? Dia akan ada jelaga hitam-hitam tu kan? Okay, so how Bima Sina basically address the issue? He basically play around with the aerodynamic of the of the uh, of the wind dalam interior tu sendiri. The device all this jelaga ni, or we call a suit, basically we device into a chamber, uh, a filtering chamber to filter the jelaga, and then the jelaga itself will be used as a ink. Uh, yang kita hitam tu kan, dia akan gunakan sebagai ink. Anila. 
ada banyak okey kita ada tu we have the suit and then we uh, give okey being channel to to a chamber a filtering chamber and then all the zelaga akan masukkan satu kolam and then that kolam tu akan release the normal punya air ataupun clean air back to the atmosphere okey dia zelaga ni akan digunakan sebagai ink later on dia macam macam impressive kan uh, dia boleh guna something that of course we, we don't have any electricity kita ada pump tak ada apa semua kan but using a normal punya a natural system, we can collect all this jelaga itself. Ah, itulah saya tak faham. Saya pun tak tahu juga. <laughs> Ter Terkonsider because this involve thermodynamic, aerodynamic of the air. Okay, around the, inside the, inside the masjid itself. Okay, ah, that will be much more on engineering punya sikit lah. Kat situ lah. Macam mana nak main pressure angin tu so that angin yang, yang, yang yes, of course. I believe so. Hmm, akan ada ceiling, dia akan come out, dia akan serap all this uh, yang udara yang berjelaga ni masuk ke dalam situ and then dia akan tapis dan dia akan kompor all this jelaga before release the clean air back to the atmosphere. Okay. Macam, um, it, I think when when we talk about Andalusia kan, Cordova, everything, they have all this system, they are using the natural system actually, the, the, all the thing that we have in nature, okay, as part of their mechanism, envir environmental mechanism in their daily life. Cuma kita je tak explore balik lah apa-apa yang kita ada lah. Konsep tekanan, uh, hydraulics, everything is already being applied in their design. Okay. Because we nowadays, okay, tak apa nak sedut, tak apa kita tak pasal pump kan. Uh, tekan satu button, pump mak tarik semua kan. Uh, during that time, kita tak ada kan. So, they divide the mechanism using the natural system. Okay, the, the, the natural mechanism to do all this process. Okay. The genius of the, of the pass lah. Okay. Dah habis cepat je ni. <laughs> Formal education ke? Okay. During that time, uh, we must, because uh, he was constricted as a as an army or uh, into military quite in, at an early, earlier stage. <coughs> so, during that time, dia macam ni tau. Kita dah muda kan? Habis di sekolah menengah kan ada dulu-dulu kita ada himat negara. Contoh kan. Okay, himat negara ni kita akan boleh pilih sama ada kita nak pergi ke engineering part ke ataupun military biasa ke. Ikut apa preference kita lah. During that time, kita akan diasah melalui skill lah. Hands on punya practical knowledge during that time. Ada tak ada formal education yang masuk military college tu tak ada apa-apa lah. So, by experience. Okay. It's good that because uh, Mimar Sinai at earlier stage pun dia dah pergi ke banyak negara, dia dah expose dengan banyak-banyak jenis of architecture, sistem yang kat negara lain lah. Uh, that's basically uh, improve a lot. Okay. okay, next on the acoustic design. Okay, the reason why we use basically uh, a dome in a mosque, dalam mosque architecture kan kita guna dome is basically on the acoustic function of the dome itself. Bukan, it's not, we can say, we, we cannot say that, okay, dia tu masjid sebab dia ada dome. Uh, tak susunya macam tu. Because Islamic architecture doesn't really uh, subjected to certain form. Uh, anything can be Islamic. Okay, because uh, Islamic architecture itself relies on the principles of the architecture itself. Kita bina tu untuk apa? Whether it is uh, align with the syariah or not. Uh, that's is the determinant of some architecture, not on the form itself. That's why kita ada the sink, uh, they are using dome as well. Or even the Hindu, some of the Hindu temple using the dome as well. Or even the uh, the churches pun guna dome juga. Uh, so kita tak ada cakap kita guna dome je, that's it for some architecture. Uh, that is, uh, it should be some architecture, it should be some. Okay, so same goes to here. The reason, the main reason why we use dome in Summit architecture particularly on the most design is on the acoustic function of the dome. Okay, because the dome will reflect the sound from the depan sampai ke belakang boleh dengar. Okay, because the shape of the dome itself, the sound reflection tu sendiri. But nowadays, but, okay. Hmm, dia bukan dome. Uh, tapi the concept tu identical. Uh, dia ada bagi space ke atas untuk reflect all the sound. Uh, for sound reflection lah. Okay, but nowadays, not all the dome are functioning as as it is lah. Sebagai yang kita, seperti yang kita harapkan lah. For example, our dome in Masjid CFS is too small untuk function as an acoustic punya dome. Ha, dia kecil kat tengah je kan. Ha, 
Dos tu akan masuk kat dalam tu tak keluar-keluar Akan lah dan dos kat dalam tu kan Dia kerja macam tu Dia bila besar Dia akan reflect daripada pergi satu pergi ke sana Reflection kan uh, you, you learn in physics, in engineering kan Macam mana reflection tu berlaku Okay, almost scientific tu cahaya kan Pergi ke sana, reflect, reflect sana lah uh, That's uh, the reflection of the sound That's the reason why we use dome If you really design for something yang macam tu Then it should be like that For example, the good example is For example, masjid besi in Pusat Jaya uh, Kita nampak dome It's very functional punya dome uh, it's, it's not necessarily to be very big Atau tinggi But it should be slender So that it, the sound can be reflected well Okay So that's it on the acoustic design The reason why I believe that Mimah Sinan adopt, Adopted dome into the architecture Badan kuda, okay. Hmm. Oh, the horseshoes punya Ah. Uh. Oh, that that's for for the arch lah. Okay. Okay, I think in terms of the stylistic design, uh, the, size, the uh, how how basically Muslim stylize the the existing design that they have from the West lah. Okay, the horseshoe, kita tahu kan ladam kuda bentuk macam tu je kan. Tapi kadang-kadang Islamic architecture, dia akan jadi lebih ada ada muncung sikit kat atas tu kan. Uh, nampak macam Islamic sikit. Uh, that's, I think in terms, that's only the uh, the stylized je lah. In terms of styling saja yang berbeza. In terms of whether it is uh, because the West, macam saya cakap tadi lah, if there, there's nothing wrong pun kalau guna horseshoe punya tu, it just that the stylized to ada as a for for identity saja lah. Okay, you can see that in uh, Andalus kan, banyak banyak saya macam tu. Because even lancet punya arches pun banyak digunakan. Sedangkan lancet arches banyak digunakan dekat gereja, for example. But in some architecture, we can still uh, see that lancet arches being used in the in the design actually. Dia tak ada masalah pun nak guna bentuk lain, bentuk lain semua kan uh, As long as benda tu actually Asalnya benda tu apa kegunaan dia What's the reason why we use that Sometimes because that form or that shape is basically uh, Identical to that or, or synonymous to that particular place uh, That's the identity of the space itself That's why kita ada macam tu lah okay, If you refer to masjid in For example in Pekan, Pahang Ada sebelah muzium kan masjid Abdullah tu Masjid putih tu You can see a lot of yang bintang-bintang Israel tu kat situ. So, kan kita nak cakap benda tu tak Islamik kan? Ah, uh, The Star of David tu. Uh, yang pucu enam tu kan? Star of David tu. Uh, because ni Islamik architecture, all these stars ni ada maksud dia tersentuh. Uh, this uh, this uh, star representing what? Uh, dalam kalau kita study betul Islamik architecture, kita orang Islamik punya Islamik teori lah. Uh, the, every each of the stars tu ada representing something actually. So kita ada cakap okay because di star Israel punya sedangkan itu star of David star of David macam Nabi Daud ni kan contoh kan apa yang tak Islamiknya for example lah it just that's why Islamic architecture doesn't associate to specific form it can be of anything okay takkanlah kita nak cakap masjid kat negara China for example yang ada bentuk macam ala-ala Chinese punya architecture tu tak Islamik uh, because it is identical to tokong punya architecture for example kan ah uh, tapi kat sana dah adalah cara dia menunjukkan dia ada Islam uh, Masjid, uh, mana satu tokoh mana satu masjid In terms of colours yang digunakan and everything lah uh, That's how flexible Islam is actually uh, Menunjukkan flexibility yang kita ada dalam Islam lah Okay Tak kisah habis awal ni <laughs> Tak kisah habis lewat tu habis awal lah okay Okay next, okay uh, The last legacy I would like to highlight is on the use of ostrich punya eggs Uh, telur burung ostrich kan Okay Dan kalau kita perasan kat dalam Sulaiman punya mos uh, Started in Sulaiman punya mos Dekat tengah-tengah Changelia tu uh, Dekat apa ni Lampu-lampu ni kat tengah-tengah tu ada Telur ostrich kat situ uh, Kenapa kita guna ostrich kat situ Because nak halang 
nak tak nak bagi order serangga ataupun spider berada berdekatan kat situ. That's why it is mentioned that Masjid Sulaimaniyah ni tak ada uh, sarang labah-labah pun. Uh, tak ada sawang, tak ada, tak ada pun. Because serangga tak ada pergi dekat dekat sana. Uh, because uh, Mimar Sinan letak ni ostrich edge kat tengah tu. Okay, saya pun google-google tadi kenapa uh, apa yang istimewanya ostrich edge ni. Uh, edge ni kan. Tanpa serangga ataupun labah-labah tak suka pergi dekat situ. Why? Because it is mentioned that even sampai sekarang pun dekat Turki masih digunakan kaedah ni. Okay, untuk halang nyamuk, untuk halang serangga, all this, apa ni, uh, apa ni, uh, labah-labah ada dekat daripada rumah, dia guna ostrich egg ni. Memang telur tu betul. Telur betul. Uh, ada uh, isi tu, ada orang-orang cakap kena ada isi, ada orang cakap tak perlu ada isi. Uh, because dalam ostrich egg ni, dia ada satu kimika yang dia akan keluarkan bau, yang kita tak bau, as a manusia kita tak bau, tapi serangga ni bau, dan serangga tak suka. Uh, that's why dia lari, tak pergi dekat. Uh, <laughs> dekat sini lah. Uh, telur burung ostrich tu. So, up to now pun, orang cakap benda tu uh, masih digunakan dekat sana. Ada orang buat yang daerah burung ostrich ni and then for the sake of having this eggs untuk dijual, untuk tujuan ni lah. Hmm. Macam menarik kan, innovation zaman tu. Walaupun it's not scientifically proven but macam petua zaman dulu lah. Uh, okay. Uh, after that, memang semua masjid pun akan ada ostrich egg ni. After uh, the device by Mimar Sinan kat sini. So, menarik something that uh, local tradition can be highlighted lah. Okay, to improve our design. Okay. Okay, ramai yang tukar kos masuk architecture dah. <laughs> Mudah kan architecture kan? Macam, uh, macam menarik. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Ada yang mention that kita kena tebuk sikit atau so that ada keluarkan something ke Ada yang mention that telur tu sendiri pun dah cukup betul lah And then they, some, some mention that the, the the surface of the egg itself is very smooth that even labah-labah pun tak boleh nak lekat kat situ Ada yang cakap macam tu Okay, there's a lot of theory lah on that Okay Okay, now we go to some uh, Tahiri approach of Imar Sinai Okay, that's I think the most important thing lah as an IOSK kan sebenarnya syarikat human knowledge apa yang bagus ni Mimar Sinan ni yang kita boleh dapatkan certain dapatkan certain uh, pengajaran lah daripada Mimar Sinan ni ok ok number one ok uh, for Mimar Sinan Mimar Sinan ni regards the talent that he have actually a gift from Allah SWT and then the architecture yang dia buat tu sendiri actually just to serve Allah SWT lah menggunakan balik Bakat yang dia ada tu ke jalan yang betul untuk to glorify Allah SWT uh, That's the reason why they construct something that Dia buat all this innovation nak betulkan masjid tu sampai dia dapat yang betul kan Because for him To build something that is perfect is a uh, Is a gift from him to Allah SWT Dengan bakat yang dia ada tu sendiri uh, That's him memang sinan Okay Very humble lah memang dia sangat uh, Membesarkan Allah SWT through hasil kerja tu sendiri Hasil kerja tu adalah untuk sebagai hadiah kepada Allah Taala lah atas kenaan bakat yang dia ada tu sendiri. Ah uh, that's his memory sinan. Okey. Yang kita actually kita boleh uh, adopt in our daily life. We have a certain a gift or certain talent. Okay, how we are going to use that. Okay. Kalau if you have a good brain for example, how you can use that to glorify Allah Subhanahu Taala. It's not just to have a better job, but how you going to to use that uh, for the betterment of the ummah for example. Okey. And building were used to glorify Allah SWT, to glorify God. Cantiknya bangunan tu sendiri adalah lagi cantik tu, lagi cantik, cantik lagi Allah SWT. Uh, yeah, just to, it's not just to imitate Allah SWT creation, of course takkan dapatkan. But they, that is the uh, the strife yang dia ada. Basically dia macam uh, perjuangan dia untuk buat something yang perfect so that it, uh, so that it can be reflected to Allah SWT lah can glorify Allah SWT. Yang tu adalah perjuangan dia untuk dapat something yang perfect. That's the best he can offer to Allah SWT. That's why most of the architecture that he produce basically most, mainly on the mosque. Dia ada mosque, ada madrasah, everything lah. Uh, that's the best thing about Mimar Sinan. And building as a tangible proof of God greatness, infinity and permanence. Uh, building tu sendiri ialah uh, bila kita, Allah jadikan kita sebagai creation dia kan. 
Kasian kita yang perfect, kita buat sapi yang perfect yang itu menunjukkan betapa perfectnya Allah SWT. Ha, that's his mirror sinai lah. Ha, that's why dia, tak ada orang suruh pun dia buat buat something yang innovation-innovation sampai dia dapat the best design tu kan. But that's for the sake of seeking the blessing Allah by uh, Allah SWT tu sendiri. Okay? Uh, susah nak cari arkitek macam tu actually. Uh, because some, sometimes uh, arkitek sekarang kita build something that is cantik ke or grand or everything, uh, grandiose everything kan. But for our own satisfaction. Uh, bukan untuk Allah SWT. Kalau kita bangga bangunan kita di di konstruk semua bangunan kita cantik, bangunan segi orang puji, dapat award macam-macam kan. We say but never because Allah SWT. Uh, that should be the essence of Islamic architect. Oh, Islamic architecture. Okay, untuk Islamic. So, sesuatu yang that should be your uh, your core value lah that you should have inside you. Okay. Kenapa kita buat architecture tu? Untuk apa? Okay. And this is, and the next is the quotes that been given to us or uh, been taught to us by our great professor sebelum ni. Uh, kita, waktu saya masuk kait dulu, uh, this the first thing, among the first thing that we have been uh, taught on. Kita dia ajar pasal this quote basically. Yang saya rasa sampai sekarang pun benda tu berbekas dalam hati saya. Okay. Okay. Architecture is the most difficult profession and he would who would uh, practice it correctly and justly must above all things be pious. Ya, yeah, this by me Marsinan quote. By me Marsinan lah. Kata kita nak apply, kita nak jadi seorang arkitek yang bagus, yang betul, dengan yang betul, basically kita first kita kena ada takwa dalam diri kita sendiri. Baru kita boleh dapat buat something dengan niat yang betul. Dan buat something yang to glorify Allah SWT. Not, it's never because of your own satisfaction. Okay. If you have your satisfaction, but your satisfaction towards apa? Untuk apa actually? Ha, tu yang lebih penting lah. Okay. And up until now pun, architecture is considered as one of the most difficult profession in the world kan? Uh, setiap tahun pun, by Harvard ke apa, saja memang architecture is top three lah, the most significant profession in the world. Okay. Uh, literally and spiritually, I would say lah. Okay. Okay, now we go for some uh, case study on the Sulaimaniyah complex. Okay, uh, Masjid Sulaimaniyah lah, the greatest design by uh, MRC9. <coughs> Okay, this is some sketches of that. Okay, the best thing about Mimar Sinan is that whenever he design uh, a mosque, it is in form of a kuliah. Or a kuliah. Okay, kalau dekat gombak kita panggil kuliah kan, fakulti tu as a kuliah kan. Uh, kuliah basically derived from this Arabic or uh, ataupun Turkish punya term. Kuliah. Okay, Sandi dia panggil kuliah. Dan untuk complex. Okay, we have a mosque. Okay, uh, surrounding the mosque, there will be madrasah. There will be uh, lots of other things kat surrounding the mosque termasuk imarat or oh, imarat is the uh, public meal kitchen yang bagi makanan kepada orang public everything ada asis imarat imara okay and other thing uh, this is example of semenya sometimes it can be a lot of a lot of other thing jadi satu komplek yang besar it's never just a masjid stand alone macam tu saja okay it carries the uh, the essence that masjid should be the center of the community okay masjid for the community So, semua ada kat surround ni. If you study Islamic Islamic city punya organisation, asal-asal Islamic city macam tu lah rupa dia. Okay, we have the mosque as a centre mosque of the uh, the city and then surrounding the mosque, there will be the accommodation of the residence of the Amir or da, Da'i Mara kat situ and then surrounding the Da'i Mara, kita ada market, kita ada all these things surrounding this uh, mosque. Mosque as the centre of the community or the nucleus of the community. Okay, that shows in the layout of this Sulaimaniyah punya masjid juga. Uh, this Sulaimaniyah masjid. Okay. And, okay, another thing uh, I think I, I have to note that um, Sinai ni whenever dia nak design something yang baru kan okay, kita nak design masjid yang baru everything dia akan pergi sejauh berapa puluh puluh kilometer daripada jauh. For example, daripada uh, kita ada slide before us kan. Pergi ke seberang sana, uh, nak overseeing the the site itself. Tempat yang dia nak buat bangunan baru tu, nak tengok which, uh, macam mana bentuk yang cantik so that the silhouette of the building tu nampak cantik dengan surrounding dia. Uh, up to that point tau, dia design bangunan dia. Daripada jauh, lupa dia akan jadi macam mana. Macam mana dia nak 
how how basically he can improve the scenery of the overall site itself uh, up to that point dia nampak silhouette tu cantik dia akan nampak lah uh, bukan setakat macam buat je terus tanpa considering all the other factors surrounding the site ok ok this is the most a centerpiece of larger complex known as Collier include space for worship and religious study and etc etc ground planes create a special hierarchy ok tak apa jadi the shape, uh, the plan of the mosque. We have, for example, of the complex, we have the mosque. Okay, the center mosque. We have the mausoleum for Sulaiman, Sulaiman the Great. Mausoleum for Hurain. Hurain is basically the the wife of the Sulaiman. Uh, Quran recitation school, public fountain, elementary school, first uh, first madrasah, second madrasah. Uh, kita ada third madrasah. Kita sampai empat madrasah dekat sini. Uh, kita ada hospital. Hospice, guest house, uh, janissary, uh, bus house, hammam, hadis college uh, and lots of other things. Uh, as well as sabil. Apa tu sabil? Sabil is basically macam uh, water cooler. Uh, tempat kita minum air kan? Uh, kalau macam kat Sarama tu ada water cooler separate kan? Now imagine that we have a water cooler at the middle of the center uh, of the town. Okay. And then at the dome. Ada macam ada one structure just to allow people to drink water for free lah. Ada yang call as sabin. Okay. Ah, uh, fountain. Uh, okay, kalau fountain saja dia macam untuk decoration. Ah, uh, tapi sabin ni untuk orang minum. Tempat orang minum lah. Ah, uh, uh, saya tak masuk ke dalam ni. <laughs> tapi uh, uh, kalau Google sabin tu kita nampak lah. Yang tu tempat orang minum air. Uh, macam public punya uh, drinking area lah. Uh, yang free flow punya air uh, kat situ that we call as sabil ok nah adik kalau buat uh, Islamic architecture punya kawasan <laughs> ok uh, this is the complex we have lots of madrasah surrounding area ni uh, this is all the uh, the building that is uh, uh, considered as part of the complex or the kuliah ok Sulaimania punya masjid kat sini dia ada madrasah, lots of madrasah up to four or five madrasah over here we have hadis punya school, hadis madrasah we have uh, hospital, we have hammam, everything surrounding this area okay and this is the interior okay luas kan, lapang, cerah banyak cahaya kan hammam, uh, I, I think that will be for for public Because Haman traditionally, uh, is, that is for public kebanyakan je lah. If you refer to Abbasiyah, Duri Abbasiyah kan, the thousands of Haman just in Baghdad sahaja. If I'm not mistaken lah. But that's for public. That, that part of the culture actually. Okay. Hmm. Uh, based on Roman punya, apa dia panggil istilah? Uh, dia ada istilah kan in Roman uh, for public bus tu. Terme, apa, something macam tu lah. Sebab kita belajar daripada cikgu seri yang sama. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is Sulaiman, 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 uh, Sulaimaniyah punya masjid. Okay, the interior of Sulaimaniyah. Okay. Compared to Ayah Sofia just now, it's very uh, gloomy inside everything kan. Uh, because uh, nampak numbers of the lighting that they have here. Kita nampak rasa ketenangan dia tu lah. Uh, something kat situ. Lapang je. And if you compare to uh, Hagia Sophia, this is Hagia Sophia, the one that's in the poster actually, Hagia Sophia. And then this one is Sulaimania. Okay, kita nampaklah kedua-dua tu, dua-dua pun grand nampak actually. Okay, cuma in terms of refinement of the elements, okay, Sulaimania is much more refined in terms of the design. Lah. And as I mentioned before, uh, awal-awal tadi, because their timeline is identical to the Renaissance in uh, in the West, Okay, kita nampak certain elements of renaissance tu ada dekat sini. Being embedded in this design lah. I would say that this is the sharing of knowledge that they have lah. Uh, or the scale from the west, uh, kita embedded dekat sini juga. Because it, even here is basically by the Roman kan. So kita nampak relationship between this one and this one. Okay, and we can see here, the design of the minaret ni is, it is an add-on to the Hagia Sophia. Sebelum ni, Hagia Sophia tak ada minaret ni. Uh, this, dia, dia baru add lah. Selepas the conquest of Constantinople. 
That's why kita nampak design of Narrate tu macam tak match sangat dengan Hagia Sophia ni. Uh, previously, Hagia Sophia is on main for as a cathedral. Okay. And this one is Sulaimania. Scaffolding, ah, cream tu tak ada lah. In terms of scaffolding, maybe I think uh, the elements of scaffolding is already there. Dah ada lah. Okay, I think during even during the Egyptian architecture pun dah ada scaffolding tu. It just that in terms of the crane itself, uh, that will be a very huge labor lah. Uh, just to construct this huge punya uh, structure macam ni lah. Yes. Mm. Okay. okay, next we have the comparison between Hagia Sophia here, dekat sini, Hagia Sophia as, as, as well as in Sumeranaya punya mosque. Okay, kita nampak kelapangan dia, perbezaan lah. Because uh, in uh, one of the ways basically Mimar Sinai try to improvise the plan of Hagia Sophia is by eliminating all the unnecessary structure outside. Kalau dalam um, Hagia Sophia, all the structure tu dia akan buat banyak kat alam. Uh, that's why dia akan jadi kerang kabut kat alam. Uh, dia akan buat sesak lah. It's a bit crowded inside. But what, what he did basically dia, all this unnecessary structure tu letak kat outside. Uh, yang main structure je ada kat, kat alam. Uh, that's why dia can eliminate lots of thing or obstruction inside the interior space. Okay. Okay. Okay, as conclusion, habis awal. Okay. <laughs> Sinai architecture is known as the functional based on comprehensible geometry, plane and rational. And it is a revolutionary style. It proposed something new. Sebelum ni kita guna hypo style of uh, most punya architecture. But now we have another type of architecture punya design lah. Uh, which is basically adopted throughout the world. Banyak tempat dia menggunakan benda yang sama. Okay. And it is a synthesis of people form with structural criticism and aesthetic perfection. Uh, that's basically how we can improve uh, our uh, in our profession. Uh, what we can improve as a, as a person. Oh, okay, it's not just we just follow the norm. Semua orang buat macam tu, kita buat A, kita buat online pun buat A, so kita pun buat A juga. But how we can improve our profession itself by contributing a new ideas or new innovation to the society. Okay, that's the most important thing that we can learn from Imam Sinai. Okay. InsyaAllah, uh, I welcome any question from the crowd. Kalau apa-apa nak tanya, boleh tanya. At what age untuk jadi arkitek? Alamak, because kita tak ada itu uh, dia punya biografi of Imar Sinan and everything and kebanyakan the one that we have pun is more on the building that he constructed. Dia ada kawan baik dia tu lah yang buat biografi dia but just but focusing more on the the building yang being constructed by Imar Sinan. I think he start developing the 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 flare in construction and everything semua during the, the military punya exercise. Dia pergi ke banyak tempat and then they try to devise something new. Uh, it, it's, for example, yang macam tadi lah, for, for him, uh, the talent is from the gift from, from God. So macam ni, dia tahu dia bagus kat situ, how they can improve himself, okay, to glorify Allah SWT. Lebih daripada macam tu lah. Umur berapa dia start come out dengan dia, this idea tu, uh, I tak jumpa dia punya sources. Okay. Kenapa dia pilih? Betul. Okay, number one, uh, as a statement. Uh, kenapa tempat tinggi tu as a statement on on top of the hill kan? So that dia jauh orang nampak. Bila nampak orang nampak, orang nampak siapa yang buat masjid tu during that time. Okay. And then sometimes uh, dia looking for the best place untuk build that that that, uh, that mosque ataupun bangunan yang dia perlukan tu lah. 
uh, the reason kenapa dia ada kat situ uh, just as landmark jadi untuk satu landmark lah okay, sometimes that, that the best place okay, to, to cover all the things kat situ oh, betul <laughs> Dia ada masuk politik juga lah dekat situ because dia ada statement kan. Hmm. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay, by the way, uh, the one, the architect who constructed Uh, Taj Mahal is one of the pupils of Mimar Sinai, student of Mimar Sinai. Okay, the architect is uh, named Yusof. Yusof is the one who constructed yang design Taj Mahal itu sendiri. Anak-anak uh, buah dia lah. Uh, by Yusof tu lah. Anak-anak uh, buah Mimar Sinai actually. Okay, in term of colouring because I think if you refer to Hagia Sophia itself because this is a uh, during that time is a Byzantine Empire kan. Even the Bahia Sofia in the raw punya form pun is not that colourful. Dia tak banyak colour sangat lah. Okay. Hmm, it's quite gloomy. Betul. So kalau macam untuk yang Sumerania punya tu, dia lebih kepada uh, looking at the construction itself, dia nampak lebih kepada menggunakan stone. Local stone yang ada dekat situ lah macam ada guna bricks. But that's why colour dia macam kelabu, biru macam tu lah. Uh, that's why we uh, some some call as a masjid biru kan. Because colour tu macam biru. Ah, ya, saya lebih. Ah, ya. Yang pun memang sini juga yang buat actually. Ada uh, blue moss. Because of the material, the, the colour of the stone itself like like a bluish in colour. Bluish grey macam tu. That's why nampak biru. Uh, that's the the materials that available at that side. Uh, at that time lah. Kat dalam pun, kat dalam baru dia start plus, plus ada idea of plastering tu ada nampak lebih lighter. Okay, soalan dari YouTube. Wow. <laughs> What makes Mimar Sinan outstanding compared to modern architects? Okay, compared to modern architects, what makes Mimar Sinan outstanding lah. Okay, kenapa dia lebih bagus daripada yang lain kan? I think uh, mainly because Uh, consider uh, Mimar Sinan during the the era that that he lived on lah, dia, dia hidup pada waktu tu, he can be considered as a genius lah. Uh, the one that he improves in lots of things. They innovate a lots of things lah. We have the local knowledge, uh, the existing knowledge from the Roman Byzantine Empire and how basically he can improve and develop the knowledge, the the knowledge that we have during the Byzantine Empire tu and then to come up with something new and something uh, much better compared to the one that being offered by Byzantine. Uh, kita kat situ kita nampak innovation tu berlaku. Now this kita nampak something that almost uh, in a in different form but using the same system. Uh, kita tak nampak something new sangat pun kat da da dalam kehidupan arkitek zaman sekarang ni lah. It just the novelty tu uh, is really can be seen kat sini. And another one is on the piety yang dia ada kat dalam Mimar Sinan tu. Takwa dia yang ada tu lah. How dia in, include takwa in his profession as an architect. Itu yang penting. Yang uh, nowadays kita tak nampak sangat lah. Ada tu ada maybe tapi kita tak nampak. Okay. Dan we have lots of other uh, renowned Islamic architects juga yang kita ada sekarang ni pun. Yang dah pass away pun dah ada. But uh, it's, it's not up to the level of Mimar Sinan lah. Dia tak, tak sebesar, tak segah memang sinan lagi. Oh saya tak, tak cover, minta uh, maaf Dr. Hawa berkat saya tak cover berapa tempoh-tempoh construction tu lah. <laughs> berapa dalam mama nak, nak construct semua tu lah, saya tak tahu tu lah. Tapi tempoh dia berkhidmat sebagai royal punya arkitek so dalam tempoh 50 tahun. Dia cover tiga orang uh, sultan Taman Usmaniyah tu sendiri. Start daripada Sulaiman sampai lagi nada tu. Okay, ada soalan di YouTube lagi? <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, not necessary so because uh, actually dia ada banyak lagi bangunan lain cuma masjid lah yang paling dominan sekali. Okay. Contohkan. Sekejap ya. Kat nota. <coughs> ah, dia. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Okay, contoh. Okay, kalau a mosque is it as a jamik. Jamik wajib besar kan. Ada 81. Okay, as, as recorded, uh, school atau madrasah ada 55, dikonstructed. Uh, small mosque atau masjid yang kecil-kecil tu, kita ada around 50. Uh, palaces, 34 palaces. Okay, we have hammam, we have 33. Mosulium, we have 19. Public kitchen or imarat, we have 16. Okay, uh, rest house or caravan rice, we have 13. Okay, bridges, we have 8. Quranic school, we have 7. Aqueduct, we have 7. They cut out from the Romans kan. Tempat salir air tu. We have seven. Hospital we have three. And store houses we have three. Uh, that's from the. Some other legacies lah. Yang masih ada lagi sampai sekarang lah. Okay. Uh, contoh. Uh, I think. Uh, one thing yang menarik is. On the emirates itself. During that time. Uh, dekat sebelumnya dekat masjid. Kan there will be emirate. Or public kitchen. Public kitchen ni adalah tugas dia. Adalah untuk masak. Okay. Mau masak kat situ kan. And then kita ada satu ruang kecil kat situ. Ada macam celah kecil macam pintu kecil, uh, macam tingkap kecil ada dia akan keluarkan makanan roti ke orang lain boleh ambil je. Uh, that's how. Reason kenapa dia buat macam tingkap dia kecil tu actually to conserve to conserve the dignity of the orang yang ambil tu. Uh, so orang tu tak rasa malu nak ambil uh, sedekah macam tu lah. That's the reason dia buat macam tu. So that kita tak tahu siapa yang ambil. Orang boleh ambil je. Dia akan hulur je ikut uh, pintu kecil tu. Uh, that's the reason that we call as imaret lah. Ya, cuma yang kita nampak legacy paling besar dia masjid lah. Sebab sampai sekarang bergah lagi nampak lagi kan. Innovation tu banyak dekat situ. Okay. Okay, material tu banyak, sekarang ni dia banyak guna stone. Stone yang dekat dekat sana. Yang bluish in colour, bluish greyish in colour. Okay. Uh, bricks punya stone. It's not just bricks and big bricks yang kita buat daripada clay everything tu. Tapi lebih daripada stone. I bring quarry punya, mongkah batu tu ada disusun and then there will be a layers of uh, absorption lah dekat tengah, -tengah tu. Okay. Oh yeah, of course. Bada Rahman ada nak tanya soalan? <laughs> yes, is this? <coughs> okay, if there's no other question, then I think uh, that's all for, for my presentation. So I thank you all uh, for lending your ears to listen to the presentation, insyaAllah. Hopefully, uh, semua orang dapatlah benefit sikit daripada perkongsian pada hari ini. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, kalau kita kenal lah, who is uh, Mekmar Sina? Mekmar, uh, Arabic words mean architect. Uh, Mekmar. Mekmar. Uh, Sinan, tunang muda kan. Mekmar, mean architect. Uh, Mekmar. Okay. So, that's all uh, about Mekmar Sinan. So, next, uh, I invite Tuan uh, Najib Sani Basri Rafiullah to uh, deliver like an application to our speaker. Uh, Kanan kiri. Kanan kiri. Kanan kiri.
Apa bunga? Bismillah, thank you. Barakallahu fikum ya akhi. Ya, Wallahi, nafa'allahu bika. Al-Umma. Ustaz nak present pasal apa Pak Ustaz? Eh? Ada banyak lagi? Al-Razi ya. Dari Turki. Previously, during uh, uh, my studies at IIUM, biasanya UK ada untuk exchange program oh, okay. to Turkey, yes. Regular nak exchange program. So, bolehlah siapa yang apa berniat untuk masa hasrat exchange program to Turkey sambil study boleh sambil jalan-jalan uh, for my semester. Eh. Uh, kat sini, our lecturer ada yang pernah exchange to Turkey uh, Mr. Amirul Nazmi Oh, dia dulu dah ada LMD uh, Dia pernah exchange program to Turkey So, dia dah ada Okay So, I think uh, this is all for tonight uh, Don't forget to scan the QR code for attendance Okay And then, don't yes. forget We have another series of Uh, talk on oh, okay. scholars and camp, on campus on 31st of January okay? 31st of January kita akan berbicara tentang who is Anjurjan okay? uh, so selama ni pergi kelas dia kan pergi Anjurjan ni tapi kita tak tahu tak apa tu Anjurjan ni okay? so harapnya uh, students from Alcom, Bar Ayah K, kalau kita datang lah berapa ramai kan. Uh, talk on, on bukan orang dia semua pun sebenarnya kan. Uh, talk on Al Jurjani, Al Imam Abdul Kahir Al Jurjani. Okay, so Insya Allah kita akan ada speaker yang sangat menarik. Jarang jarang, jarang jarang bersuara, uh, patient. So nanti kan. <laughs> okay, uh, that's all from us. Uh, Terima kasih kerana menonton! Terima kasih kerana menonton! Terima kasih kerana menonton! Terima kasih kerana menonton!